Welcome back to our channel, guys. This is part two of our Q&A session a few weeks ago, month. We put it out there to our audience. Uh, if they got some questions regarding nomadic life, van life. Such a big response, we decided to split it up and make two separate videos. The first one was more on nomadic life. This one is van life specific. In case you don't know, I'm Andre. And I'm Lisa. We've been fully nomadic for the last five years, but we've been spending most of our time in Europe for the last two years. That's why we got a little bit something to say about motorhome life. And we are heading back to Europe soon to our motorhome Millie, and we'll be continuing our journey through Europe for the rest of the year. Welcome to our channel. We're Andre and Lisa. Over the last 20 years, we have traveled together to more than 40 countries. Five years ago, we embarked on a long-term sabbatical and have been nomadic ever since. For most of the past two years, we have been exploring Western Europe with our motorhome. This year, we plan to make our way through Eastern Europe towards Denmark for summer. We'll be heading south for winter and just maybe make it to Morocco. So hit that subscribe button and join our adventure. Now we're going to do it a little bit different. I actually haven't seen these questions and Lisa's going to ask them. I'm in charge today. I think I heard there's quite a lot of uh, questions so we're going to do rapid fire answers where I can and if possible refer you to other videos or maybe even to our website. There have been so many questions that I've grouped them into certain categories. We're going to be talking about our camper van Millie, also what it's like to own an older vehicle. There have been quite a lot of questions about that. We're going to talk about parking, overnighting, security, off-grid living, practicalities of van life, things like energy, water, LPG, toilets, all of those kind of things. We're then going to touch on the future and we'll chat a little bit about the question of is van life for you? Are you ready? <laughs> Feels like we're a game show. No pressure, no pressure. Let's start with our camper van, Millie. We're going to just start by telling you that we do have a previous video on the questions and things that you should ask yourself if you're looking at buying a motorhome for the first time or maybe even the second time. So we'll link to that video below and that really covers a lot of aspects when it comes to considering which is the right motorhome for you. We also have a video on a reflection after a year of full-time living in our 20-year-old motorhome, what we would have wanted differently, and if we could do it all over again, what we would have changed. So check that out, or we'll link to that in the description below as well. So our first question is from Sailing with George, and he asks, how do you guys manage to buy and register, get insurance, and so on? It depends on the country you're from and the country you want to buy in. We are both Italian citizens, so we are fortunate we can actually buy and register in Italy. Allegedly, you can buy a vehicle and register it in your name in Spain if you have a Schengen visa, but that's unconfirmed. Insurance in Spain is apparently also not a problem. Best places for motorhomes, in my opinion, is probably uh, Netherlands and France. That's in terms of options and choices. Uh, options and availability, so that's where you should check out. Insurance very much depends on the country where you buy in. So before you say a little bit more about insurance possibly, Brian Patterson also asks, who do you get your insurance through and did you get permanent living cover? Because we bought our vehicle in Italy and we registered in Italy, we have to get Italian insurance. Italian insurance is notoriously expensive and if you've driven in Italy you'll probably understand why. We actually get a pretty good deal uh, because we're part of like a camping club. Something you should look at joining like an association, a caravanning association, motor zone club, which gives you maybe like group benefits. We only have third party insurance with roadside assist. And the reason we do that is to make it affordable. And if you have a new vehicle, you obviously would need comprehensive insurance. We opt not to go that route because our vehicle is actually quite old and we, we self-insure that risk. From Marcus, he says, I would have questions regarding old Millie. What is the length? Is it easy to handle for your lifestyle? Do you wish she would be longer, shorter? And what is your experience with the LPG availability in the countries you travel? So we're going to hold the LPG until later on when we discuss LPG, but let's just talk about length. This okay. is our ongoing question, bigger or smaller? Firstly, we did a comprehensive video on how to choose a motorhome, and we'll link to that down below as well. And in that, we're going to detail about length, width, height, weight, layouts, what we would like. So you'll probably find most of your answers there. Just shortly, in a perfect world, something I can stand up in, something that's 
narrower than 2.2 meters, something that's... Around the six meter mark. Around six meter mark, but still has a massive garage and a full bathroom and a queen size bed and a... Yeah, yeah, those things don't exist. Let's quickly give you Millie's dimensions are 6.25 and then we have the bicycle rack on the outside which is about another extra half a meter. She's under three meters height including all rooftop gadgets and she's 2.23 wide. It works for us, I wouldn't want bigger. Smaller presents problems, I'm quite a tall person so I have to consider all those limitations. We, I can't sleep with wise in a normal van, it has to be a motorhome. We have to do lengthwise beds. Uh, I need to be able to stand up, we need storage, so all these things. Go check out that video, I'll answer all your questions. Okay, next category, parking and overnighting. We start with a question from my heel coach. Do you have a certain amount of time you stay parked somewhere? Unofficially, we do have a rule that we generally don't stay in one place longer than three nights, just because you tend to fall into a comfort zone and it's more difficult to move on. That's one thing. Secondly, it depends on where you are. Some countries, if we park, you're legally only allowed to spend one night. So you need to move on. Depends on the location, depends on the season, the country you find yourself in. You have to set yourself a few goals like Otherwise, you might never get to that next destination. So we know we want to have this rough route for the year. You have to get an idea of on this month end, you may need to make it to this point. Otherwise, you're never going to get there. She Sales asks, how easy is it to park anywhere? Can you park anywhere in Europe? Every country has unique laws sort of limiting or allowing what you can do. Some countries do make it a lot easier. The ones that stand out, Croatia, no wild camping is legal. Whereas in countries like Italy, you legally allowed to overnight in your vehicle almost anyway, as long as you don't exhibit any camping type of behavior. And that's mostly true for places like Portugal, Spain, and France. Obviously, it's a whole different story because there's so many more parkings available, yes. airs available. We've written up on our blog on Portugal and Spain, so you guys can check that out, wewillnoman.com. Countries like Denmark is a bit more tricky. There's gray areas in between as well. Mr. Frobo says, hi guys, you mentioned six meters and we're looking at south of Spain and I spotted a sign, length sign in a previous video. Is this common? Do parks have six meter limits regularly? Or do people simply ignore them? Signs and fines. Yeah, that's a really big one. The thing about Spain is, according to Spanish road traffic law, they can't discriminate on vehicle type. So just because you drive a motorhome, they can't explicitly ban motorhomes. So they have to find another uh, way, another way <laughs> to legally discriminate against you. And the only way they can do it is limit by height of vehicle, length of vehicle. And weight. And weight. And so in Spain, you, you quite often see that there's length restrictions in certain areas. And that's obviously to limit where people overnight outside of peak season you might find that it's less um, enforced. enforced the truth is that this is mostly along the coast mm. and you will find loads of people ignoring those signs and our recommendation is don't take that risk it's not only that we're all part of this community and ultimately we want to keep doing this without fouling it for everybody else so if you're going to flaunt the, the regulations and just do what you want and, and be chuffed with yourself because you get away with it. You're actually doing everybody else a disfavor. So stick with the rules and hopefully we can go back there again next time. You ready for a challenging one? Yes. This one's from Kevin and Nikki. They ask, what has been your absolute favorite park up in the last year? Oh, impossible. <laughs> I was thinking we should do a whole separate video on yeah. this, our top 13 park ups or something like that. Sometimes you just stumble upon something uh, unexpected, which is just in that moment is near perfect. Whether it's that spot, the weather, the sunset, the, the vibe, the people. We've actually went through the last 12 months thing, and you said, how many places did we sleep in? We slept in 150, yeah. How do you pick one? <laughs> I, oh, no, we're gonna have to talk about that in another video. Moving on. All right, let's move on to security, a more serious topic. Mm. Uh, Mona Itani says, I would like to ask you about safety on your trips, yours and the van. I'm gonna read through the rest of the questions okay. first, and then you can just answer this whole topic together. On the road with the van says, Safety is a big thing for me. Do you ever feel vulnerable in any situations? And what do you do with your valuables when you leave the van to go exploring? Alan Ball says, yeah, van security. I seen a camper with a camera on all four sides, which display on your phone. And then Susie asks, security concerns, both for you, the bike and the van. You a lot there to go through. Obviously, you have to be cognizant of risks. And I think we tend to be more aware of sort of the general vibe of an area. Uh, we do avoid 
big cities, if we go closer to cities, we tend to stick around the outskirts and we'll go to a, a secure campsite. We do have our routines, our security routines, so we make sure we secure the motorhome as best as possible. We park it in a place which is not isolated or away from everybody. Not that it really makes a difference, but we do secure our doors from the inside, whether we're there or not. Mm -hmm. Use extra locks. We have motion sensing cameras. Uh, which we can monitor remotely. I would love to do the whole surround camera thing, but I haven't really figured out a practical way to do that, but maybe down the road. In terms of sleeping in the van or living in the van and feeling vulnerable, on occasion, you do find yourself in a place where you look around and it feels a bit shady. Always go with your instincts. But if you, if you feel like it's dodgy, maybe if you see a lot of broken glass from windows being smashed, take that as a sign. We haven't really experienced it. We do read reviews thoroughly when we use the park for night app to get a vibe of where we should and shouldn't go and if there's any negativity just avoid those places to start with we've only ever had to move once at night and that was more for the fear of being driven into by boy races in yeah. a very big open parking lot on the other occasion we had youngsters playing music loudly but this is one of those things more than often than not you're perfectly fine as long as you keep your words about you don't open your door to strangers at night rather don't confront, drive away and go find the same space. And whenever we visit cities, we rather pay for secure parking, make yeah. sure that the van is looked after, that there's cameras there. And we generally also spend the day out and come back to the van when it does get dark. We don't often so, leave the van alone at night. On the bicycle, uh, so we've mounted a secure point, like a locking point onto the van itself. So we're locking our bicycle to the rack, but actually locked onto a mounting point onto the van. And we do use high grade chains we actually when we cycle our biggest concern is our battery will get nicked but we do use high quality chains more than one chain to actually lock the bike up when we go we also use a motion sensing alarm which is quite an effective deterrent and in fact the motion sensing alarm stays on the bicycle so we can arm and disarm it remotely so even if we're in the van and someone messes with a bicycle we should be able to be aware of it and we also keep it undercover as best as possible. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We've upgraded Bike Mike security a little bit. Extra security to deter all these naughty little thieves. Ooh, what a bike spike this is. I'm gonna steal it. <laughs> okay, okay, trauma queen. <laughs> That's why you'll never get a job as an actor. Valuables, it's an ongoing challenge. We do have a safe in our van, which we use for um, personal valuables, and we also have a secure space for larger items like cameras and laptops but you have to be vigilant in making sure that that's where stuff goes and find yourself a sort of security protocol and a procedure which you follow each and every day even if you're just going out for a half an hour run okay shoot. all right let's go to our off-grid living i think again i'm going to ask you there's three questions coming from big lab travels how about an idiot's guide on the technical things you need mm. to get a van to live off grid? Jessica Mayer says, I think it'd be really interesting to do a video on the environmental impact of the RV lifestyle. Now, this is actually quite an interesting one because she says in our homes, people tend to take long showers, heat or cool the entire house, leave a light on in another room. Um, they found some drawers, watering lawns and all that kind of thing. And Susie also says, in my opinion, I think the pros outweigh the cons in terms of environmental impact because you're living in a much smaller space and using less energy. And Alan Bell says, in a camper, you have to count everything in and out, which means you are more conscious, which you don't do in a house. And this is absolutely true. So let's talk a little bit about how we've made Millie from a completely weekend motorhome into an off-grid vehicle. I can't give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to make this work. Uh, I think there's a lot of information out there already. It very much depends on the type of Traveling you want to do, some people want to do more overlanding style, you maybe want a 4x4 truck, maybe you limit it to something smaller because you can't park it where you live. I think off-grid living pretty much is about power and water and waste and maybe connectivity I'll throw in there. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll touch on each of these separately in a minute, but just to summarize, we're in a complete agreement, especially if like us, we don't travel vast distances. So we don't actually use a lot of fuel. Um, our footprint's tiny. We're very conscious of almost everything we use. We produce very little waste. So no doubt to me, this can be a sustainable and environmentally friendly way. And I think you're, you're, uh, you become so conscious 
of everything you use. We, we use less energy in terms of electricity than most people use a single no. light bulb in an hour in their homes. Because you are so conscious, you end up consuming less in terms of materialistic things, clothing, uh, just so many other aspects of your life become more, more minimalistic. You tend to get what you need, not just because you want it, you, because it's a real requirement for something. I think maybe one day we will do a video, an updated video of all the changes we've made mm. to make our lives simpler. Keeping in mind that we started with an old motorhome that's got some existing Constance. somewhat clunky infrastructure, you know, mm. but we just try to make it as cost effective change to suit our lifestyle. This is not the optimal for everybody. So let's get to the practicalities. Yeah. With regards to energy, we've got Lewis Clark asks, hey guys, what do you do for solar and battery setups? Mm -hmm. Do you clearly keep all your laptops and cameras charged and are able to be off grid for a while? Uh, Ronnie Long says, how do you have enough electricity for everyday life? Because when you're not on hookup, the solar panels or the roof are only enough in summer. And this is very true, mm -hmm. especially for the important things like lighting, water pump, aircon, etc. Because we have an old van, it came fitted with like a, a habitation battery or a leisure battery. And that battery was set up to run the lights, the water pump and some basics. We just converted all our lights to LED firstly and put more energy efficient everything in there. Made a huge difference. We did add some fans, etc. So, but we do monitor our um, energy consumption on that battery very, very finely. Mm -hmm. What we ended up doing is putting a solar panel to service that battery solely. And obviously when you drive, you also get the energy from the alternator. How much energy you need is going to depend on what your requirements are in the van because our habitation or leisure battery doesn't drive any uh, inverters because we don't have a desire for that. And we, when the days become much shorter during the winter in Europe, we do tend to see that we've probably got, got about like four days of energy before we really need more solar or we need to move. Modern vans have other options available to them. You can fit the battery to battery chargers, so there's a lot more efficiency. You can convert to lithium, so it gives you more um, usability of your battery capacity. So if you're sticking to these AGM style deep cycle gel batteries, there are some limitations. To complement that, what we've opted to do is get a separate solar bank, which got a built-in inverter, which gives us the possibility to use that for electronics and general other issues. Uh, well, that was now two years ago. We've looked at what was available in the market. At that point, we decided to go for the EcoFlow systems, uh, River 2 Pro back then. A lot of new entrants are available on the market. There's some changes in the battery technology. So we are actually changing now to a LFP style battery, which will give you more cycles, which is hopefully going to increase the longevity of these products. And we have two dedicated solar panels servicing this um, unit. The advantage is you can literally take it out by its handle and go plug it in somewhere. You can, if you have a big backpack, you can probably go to the coffee shop and go charge it within an hour. And uh, these units are super um, handy and you get smaller ones. So I think it gives you a bit of redundancy as well, which I like. And you're not investing massively into an old motor because if you're going to put say a bank of four lithium batteries and a victron b2b charger and a uh, massive solar bank on your roof with a, a solar controller it's going to cost you a lot of money you can easily spend five thousand euros uh, this was an important aspect for us was to keep it as a separate mm. investment that we can either move on to a new motorhome if we need to or if something happens, you can sell it independently from the motor. The most important thing is acknowledging what your requirements are. So we power users when it comes to digital electronics, like laptops, when I do video editing, my laptop draws a lot of power. But for most people, it's not really an issue. And season, of course, makes a big difference. We mm. found that for 80% of the year, we find but those three months over winter really do mm. make that much of a difference and become so much more challenging for getting solar. There's actually plenty of solar available. You just need to find a way to store it. So one thing what we've did is just to expand our storage is to use our e-bike batteries as a separate storage. So we have extra energy, we make sure our batteries are charged, and then we can feed that energy from the e-bike batteries back into our solar bank. Hmm. So let's talk about fresh water, grey water. Ricardo asks, I might have dreamt it, but I thought you said you had a filter on your water fill hose. Mm. In other words, the water entering your tank is filtered, if you could share the details. And then we can also just talk about cleaning and showering. So let's talk about first getting water in and then grain out. One thing I wish we had was more fresh water, but once again, this is a balancing act between the weight you carry. Mm. We only have 80 liters of fresh water in our main tank. 
Whereas 120 would be much better because that will determine how long you can actually stay away from freshwater sources. But we carry two extra jerry cans of water sometimes. And the truth is, it's probably easier just to get another two cans and leave them empty. And if you know you're going away for a bit longer, just fill them up, put them in the garage, and then we top up our, our main tank. So we do use a particle filter on our hose when we fill our main tank. It's marginally successful, but it does at least keep the sand out of our tank for mm -hmm. the most of it. Our water pump also has a separate filter, but that's also only for particles. Now you do get like carbon style filters for um, filler hoses, but I haven't really experimented with that. What we opted to do is to fit a proper four stage filtration system to a drinking water tap. So wastewater, I think was the gray other water, thing. Yeah. And gray water. Gray water is, not a massive challenge around Europe. There's plenty of places you can get rid of it. In fact, you should technically be able to dump gray water waste in almost any uh, uh, street grid, as long as it's not explicitly disallowed. A tip on gray water is to always dispose of your gray water as soon, soon as, as possible. possible. If you can, wherever you park, to be able to put a bucket under your van, mm. let that water come out immediately and dispose of it. Because after 24 hours, gray water waste smells foul. <laughs> Obviously, if you're parked inside a city, you can't just, yeah. it's not possible to run water. It's not, so you need to find an appropriate place to do it. And that's really important to be respectful with regards mm -hmm. to that. It's the worst thing where you see motorhomes and as they leave, or even before they leave, they just leave these puddles, puddles. everywhere. And that just really gives motorhoming yeah. a very bad name. You know, I, 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 I'm sort of torn because if you, if you have a shower in your van and that shower water runs straight through the van in a, to a paved parking and it finds its way into a grid, I don't think it's the worst thing in the it world. It depends where you are. Honest. I think you just have to be cautious of your environment. Sure. If you're out in nature, it's even less of a problem unless you're near a freshwater source. So just be cognizant of that. With regards to the toilet, we have actually got a lot to say on a toilet because we've made a change to our toilet and we've got rid of our cassette toilet and changed it to a separate toilet. So that's going to be a mm. whole separate, excuse the pun, upcoming video. So we're not going to touch on toilet right now. No, we're we... going to move straight on to groceries and shopping. Right, the next one, laundry. Well, I think I can take this one, is that laundry can sometimes be such a nightmare and sometimes it can be such a joy. Very often in countries like Spain and I think Portugal, France, France you can find a laundromat outside of the grocery stores mm. in the same parking lot. So that's fantastic. You can put your laundry in while the laundry is going, do your grocery shopping and come back out. Otherwise, what we often do is we look for a campsite and we pay to go to the campsite just so you can use the laundry machine. And in Sweden, this can be in the form of staying at the marinas to be able to use laundry facilities. The biggest challenge is that in summer, you can wash some things by hand and still hang it out to dry if you're staying in a campsite. Whereas in winter, you definitely need to do dry cleaning or drying as well because clothes need to be packed away. Look, sometimes you, you can stop at a place right in front of the door. You can drive away two hours later as well. Good. Some days it's just a whole day's activity. But these are the realities of living on the, on the road. And the other thing is that we put everything in the laundry together. So we don't wear whites or anything that might. Everything has to be able to be washed together and everything has to be able to go through a tumble dryer. So those are most of the questions with cool. regards to van life. Now there are some on the future. There's a future. <laughs> There's a future. Future van so life. Van Scran asks, how long will you carry on motorhoming and would you get a bigger or smaller van in the future? Susie asks, do you think you'd ever try Norway again mm -hmm. now that you have a better idea of what to expect? Uh, maybe we should do these ones one at a time, actually. Okay. So how long will we carry on motorhoming? Well, we have this motorhome in Europe now. Now, we don't know what the future of using older vehicles in Europe is, firstly. We don't know how mechanically sound our vehicle will be indefinitely, but as long as the existing motorhome serves a purpose, I think we'll hold on to it. We're not going to do full-time travel in Europe by motorhome indefinitely. I think that's not the plan, but there's no reason for us not to keep the motorhome and use it on occasion. So once the next chapter, which we don't know how long it might be, it might still be another year and a half in Europe or longer before we want to do something else. I must admit though, there is a small part of me that's super tempted to look at something a little bit more uh, multifunctional, like a 
four by four. <laughs> but the problem is weight becomes an issue. I might need a, a, a different license to drive it, like an Iveco four by four, which you then ship to other continents potentially and do more overlanding. Or we keep Millie and we get another vehicle in another continent and we sort of have mm. two vans and we move between the places depending on the season. We still love that life. I don't think we're tired of it no. yet. We still think it's the best way to explore Europe, but we aren't convinced that we want to be in a van full time for 365 days of a year. And we're just also itching to see and travel in other ways again. There are areas, continents that really lends itself to this type of travel. I guess North America, Central America to an extent, and definitely South America. So there's still a lot of van life ahead of us. Yeah, so, uh, but we'll probably intersperse it with some other types of traveling, mostly to sort of escape the worst season or to give ourselves a break, or maybe just slow it down. We'll see. Will we do Norway again? Of course, we'd love to do Norway again. Uh, we learned quite a few lessons. We did not go to Norway as prepared as we should have. I think we underestimated uh, um, Norway as a destination. Firstly, we were there in the wrong season and it was actually the right season, but everybody else was there too. So I would prefer to go to Norway slightly on the shoulder season to avoid the massive amount of traffic you find. Norway is very different. I think our old motor was, would struggle a little bit to cover those distances and we'll have to prepare ourselves a bit better. Otherwise, we'll just go at a different time of the year and try it again. Definitely have to return. Tracy says, would you ever consider shipping Millie to a country outside of Europe? Okay, I think we just covered that. No. <laughs> <laughs> and packing our trunks is... Wait, wait, Morocco? Does that count? It's outside Europe. And it's going to be by ship? Yes. Packing our trunks says, how much time do you devote to your lovely videos? <laughs> Too much, obviously. Uh, they were also asking, would you ever travel to the UK in Mali? Yes, we want to go to UK. We haven't quite figured it out yet. It's just like, what do we need to do? Is it worth it? But like, maybe we'll alternate or no, adapt our route this year on our way south to go see some family, but we don't know yet. But, but stay tuned if you want to know. Secondly, do we ever point? argue? Wait, wait, that wasn't a question. <laughs> That's not a question. Okay, well, we didn't know that yet. I can honestly say that making videos for youtube is a chore <laughs> he spends far too much time on no, these no. videos it, it becomes easier the more you do it but the more you do it uh, the more time you spend on it so mm -hmm. I, I, look whether it's worth it it's debatable we don't make any money on this channel um but you can buy us a coffee link down below and i think you need to be quite big to make money but it started as a fun project we started recording ourselves many 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 years ago we've only recently really sort of found our vlog style and i think the van life style that's suited the challenges are when you're on the road full time it's actually quite difficult to do planned shoots like we don't know what's gonna happen today i have no idea we can think we know whereas you can't set out this is the plan for the day and this is how we're going to shoot it and this is really what you need to do to be able to make good videos so you've got to find a balance between telling a story showing a little bit of reality and not spend too much time so it overwhelms the experience for yourself mm. so finding that balance between visiting a location enjoying it but capturing it and a lot of that is for our own benefit as well i mean very often we have the conversation should we continue with this is it worth the effort is it worth the time mm. and we always come down to the same thing we say okay well then let's continue making videos just not for youtube and then we say, well if you put in all the effort and we can share it with at least one or five people who enjoy it then why not share it there's a big factor of enjoyment and satisfaction to create something one's just got to be mindful of your motivations it's like if you want to build a channel, there's plenty of ways to grow channels and make money out of YouTube. But unfortunately, the travel genre is, is quite limiting if you want to build more like relationship based channels. So what would you say? How many hours do you spend on a video post filming? Some videos like this, we sit down and we talk. It's, it's a lot easier, but to actually edit as these can be quite tricky. Depends on how much elements we put into it. Uh, if we do a normal van life, say a week in the life of there's a lot of filming so you generate a hell of a lot of footage it takes a lot of time to get through it i said every video to edit post shooting probably minimum four hours? Five, five to hours. six hours mm -hmm. i would say minimum just to put an edit of a mm -hmm. 15 minute video together it's a lot of work kalinka asks i would like to know about psychological issues are your sad days which everyone has worse or more intense worse than you had when living in an ordinary fixed home? And what would you advise someone willing to live in a van for a long run in terms of psychological aspects? 
from my perspective, how do you manage stress? How do you streamline your like day to day needs? I think for us, it's a lot about finding processes to deal with issues, reduce friction. I'm not talking about friction between mm -hmm. us. I'm talking about everything shouldn't be difficult. I don't think either of us suffer from depression or anxiety, fortunately. Well, it depends. Driving in some countries, I definitely have anxiety. Yeah, that's self-inflicted. Self <laughs> but I think what's important is that van life or living in a van isn't going to take away any issues no. or problems that you may have or that already exist. You need to first be very comfortable with yourself, spending time with yourself, being mm. in isolation. If you're a couple, being with each other, you should already be comfortable with each other, spending a lot of time together, making decisions together, because there's going to be a lot of that. And yes, it might exasperate that, but if you've got a good relationship and you're in a good place, it's going to make it better. And if you're in a bad place, it's not going to make it better. It's going to make it worse. You have to find your purpose and the reason why you want to live this way. Living full-time on a motorhome or a van is different from going on a holiday mm -hmm. or a short trip. You, you just have to guard against being becoming normalizing everything. The idea that it's just another sunset, it's just another. It's actually, you, you have an opportunity to do something extraordinary and we need to hold on to what makes it special. Because we human, we will find negativity and sadness eventually. I think it follows us around. Being on the road for us, I think, does help because every day is sort of a new experience and there's a lot of excitement. When you plan for something new, there's always something to look forward to. And we've reduced stress in our lives massively. There is a risk of procrastination, maybe uh, self-inflicted boredom. I don't know. I don't think I'm ever bored in the motorhome. <laughs> Sometimes you do think, am I being productive? We're so conditioned by society to, so, oh, we have to be more productive. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of get past that idea. Maybe initially the idea is just to f figure out how long you want to do this and just enjoy it. And realize what it's about and why you're doing it. Living in a motorhome mm -hmm. is inevitably a compromise in many many regards. So you have to ask yourself, why are you doing it? And then absolutely appreciate those reasons. Find something that sort of ground you and, and add value to your life. And I think it's hard to say whether you will be able to do it forever or how long you will be happy doing it. But it's definitely worth giving it a try. It's not a fix, but it can be an incredible, incredible experience. On that high note, let's wrap this up. We still received a whole bunch of other questions, which we can't get to in this video. So thank you for all the questions that you did leave us. We hope that this did answer most of them. And for those of you whose questions were not answered, we may answer those in a separate video coming up. We're still working on our toilet video. Might be an interesting one. We're still in South Africa. We're going back to Europe in a couple of weeks. And although we're not traveling, we're still making some content. As always, <laughs> thanks for watching. Hit that subscribe button, smash that like button, and leave us a comment. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Ciao. Are you cleaning windows? <laughs> Isn't this how you do? <laughs>